In my book, I talk about this paradox that democratization is advocated often on individual values, but democratization happens and is activated on the basis of collective action. So what the civil service examination system did was essentially taking out collective action mindset from the Chinese population. And that's a system we have had since the sixth century. You are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Dan Bannock. Ever wondered why the state in China is so powerful? For many years, even my guests struggled to come up with a coherent explanation for the power and reach of the Chinese state. But he believes he has now found an answer. In a forthcoming book, Yasheng Huang writes that if he could only name one difference between China and other civilizations, it would be Ke Jue, the imperial civil service examination. Yasheng argues that this examination, which is the foundational institution of political China, has historically maximized a specific type of knowledge in the minds of the population, such as memorization. It has also reduced the scope of or eliminated alternative ideas. The civil service exam made the state all-powerful. The state was able to monopolize the very best of human capital, and in doing so, the state deprived society access to talent and preempted organized religion, commerce, and intelligentsia. While the exam is China's blessing, he argues that it is also a curse as it decimated society. Yasheng Huang is a professor of international management and faculty director of action learning at the MIT Sloan School of Management. His book, which will be published by Yale University Press early next year, is The Rise and Fall of the East, Examination, Autocracy, Stability, and Technology in Chinese History and Today. Yasheng and I discussed the recent protests against COVID-19 lockdowns in several parts of China and how these are potentially different from previous protests. Thereafter, we discussed the role and attraction of merit-based recruitment to the civil service, the mindset of bureaucrats, and how the civil service examination has shaped state-society relations in China. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Yasheng, it's so lovely to see you. Welcome to the program. Uh, Thank you, Dan. It's good to see you. Happy to be on the program. As you know, there are these protests that are going on in China, and these are protests against lockdowns. And from what I've read about your views on the protests, maybe the reason is that expectations have changed, that there was an expectation that things would change following the, the party congress that was recently held. That has not happened in terms of loosening of restrictions. That's one thing. But you also think that maybe something else is at work, that maybe there was something lacking before in terms of a coordinating mechanism that has somehow magically appeared because of the zero COVID policy that affects everyone in the country. So let's start with your thoughts, Yasheng on the ongoing protests, maybe you can expand on each of the issues that I just mentioned in terms of why these are very different today than all the other protests that have been taking place for for many, many years in China. So China is not short of protests per se. Maybe under Xi Jinping, at least by official statistics, the frequency has declined, but there are many, many uh, academics who have done careful documentation of protests. And if you see the curve, at least before Xi Jinping, it was rising year by year. The big difference between those protests and the protests that are happening now is that the previous protests didn't share a universal experience across multiple regions in the country, 
across multiple socioeconomic classes, you know, between the intellectuals and the workers, between the rural residents and the urban residents. There were protests against Caesar of land by the local governments, but mostly by peasants. So if you are a resident in Shanghai, why would you be bothered by that? And in many ways, you are a beneficiary of that because you can buy housing at lower prices because the land was acquired at low prices. Intellectuals complained, well, but, you know, private entrepreneurs are, were doing very well, right? They expanding businesses and making money, traveling. Young people didn't quite bother with, with these things, right? They could listen to rock and roll. They can watch TV. So they, they lacked a universal experience. What COVID zero has done is universalizing misery across regions, across socioeconomic classes, remarkably in a homogeneous society, unlike India, for example, across different ethnic groups, right? The Uyghurs and the Han Chinese. So that is something new. In 1989, there was a universal, not experience, but there was a universal call for political reforms and democracy. That was universal in terms of values. Since then, there has not been such a universal experience until now. As I think many of my listeners will know, or at least I hope they know, that protests or so-called mass demonstrations take place on a regular basis in China every year. Some have calculated this to be over 100,000 a year. So it isn't as if this is new, but you know, I remember some protests getting more international attention than others. 1989, of course, was was the big one. But there's also been several years ago, the Wukan protests, mm -hmm. where you had villagers cordoning off their village and preventing others from entering the village. Yeah. So the point here is that there are all of these protests that take place. And as you were saying, it could be different types. And William Hurst from Cambridge has been talking about five different types of protests. Yeah. You could talk about labor protests. That really has to do with more union rights, welfare benefits. It could be rural protests. As you were saying, it could be corruption or you know access to certain public goods. It could be student protests, which are still rare, but we do see some students coming out. I think I saw some of these viral videos from Tsinghua University. Then there's urban protests that are also related to provision of public goods. It could be environmental or pollution issues. And then it is outright political dissent. And I did a study several years ago on one of these, which is really the farmers' protests on compensation, right? The typical thing is that the government has taken over land. The compensation that is offered by the government is inadequate. So one has to take this up into the legal system, but the legal system is heavily weighed in favor of the state. And so these protests somehow go on for a while and then they stop. And so the question is, do you think these protests are different in the sense that because of technology, because of the fact that people are now more aware of what is happening in different parts of the country that was perhaps not possible before? And as you said, because there's this one common denominator that binds everybody together, do you think this will mean a long lasting series of protests or will the powerful Chinese state be able to resolve this pretty quickly? I don't think the lack of awareness before was the reason why you had segmented, localized protests. The, the, the Chinese social media at one point was actually quite free. And they, they, there was a lot of awareness on social media, on the farmers' protests, on Wukan incident, and, and intellectuals actually participated very, very strongly in condemning the local governments for cracking down. So the awareness was there all along as the awareness today. This was more the case before 2012? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So by, at least by official statistics, there has been a decline of protests under Xi Jinping, although that could be statistical falsification and underreporting. But leaving that, uh, that issue aside, when you have localized issue-specific demonstrations and protests, the solutions are also easier. You just buy them off, right? There's a saying in China, using people's money because Chinese currency is people's money to solve people's problems. 
So typically what they did was, okay, the state-owned enterprise workers uh, protested because they got laid off. Then the government would compensate the workers and then arrested the ringleader. Right? So that was the, the, the technique. Now, how do you compensate uh, the current protesters? According to one estimate, in 2022, there have been some 400 million people under some sort of lockdown this year. Right? And there's no way you can do the kind of compensation strategy as they did before. And the money is not there, the capacity to do it is not there, right? Plus the fact that 400 million people now have developed some shared experience with each other, right? So I see that as a game changer. There's a, another component of your question, which is about how sustainable these protests are. Sustainable protests require organization and continued coordination. What happened last time around this weekend was a fire in Urumuchi in Xinjiang province that resulted in, again, by official statistics, a 10 death, right? And then people can res resonate with that very, very easily because those people died in a high rise. The high rise was blocked you know, Shanghainese and people in Beijing, they live in high rises. Their high rises are blocked by the zero COVID measures. So the resonance is very easy. That served essentially as the coordinating, galvanizing event. When you don't have organization, you have technology, but as you know, Chinese controls of technology are incredibly advanced. You cannot use technology to organize these collective action. When you don't have technology, or the technology being prevented from doing that, when you don't have political organization, my prediction is that uh, the protests are going to kind of fade away for a period of time until there's another bad accident. And this is also because the police are going to step up their actions and they are going to go after what they believe to be the ringleaders. And I also predict they are going to ease some of the COVID controls. So essentially a combination of targeted crackdowns, easing of COVID controls to some extent, and lack of explicit coordinating mechanism. In combination of that, we may see some stability. But I think what is known now, and we know that now, and the Chinese leadership knows now, people are angry, are frustrated, are anxious. So in the future, anything that is similar to what happened to that high rise can trigger further protests without warning. Having studied the Wukan protests and looking at the unfolding protests now, I see one major difference. In many of the previous events, there was a very sophisticated strategy for many of the protesters. So Wukan is a very good case because it was complaining about local officials to the higher ups in Beijing, basically saying local officials are corrupt. They're selling away our land. Can the party please save us? It was never explicitly about, you know, a criticism of Beijing. Now, here we see nowadays something different. You see a direct criticism of the party leadership. And another point I wanted to raise when you mentioned the ringleaders being arrested, the strategy I've seen in some of the protests, particularly in Wukan, was that the ringleader actually was arrested first and then released. And then there was a local election. And this leader then became the local party secretary. Yeah. So it was also co-option into the machinery. Yeah. So the main point here, and I'd like you to reflect on, is if you see this more explicit criticism of the party leadership in Beijing, rather than just being content with criticizing the locals, which was a pretty good strategy in many ways, I felt, in the old days. Well, so so I, I completely agree with that. And there are two differences that explain this dynamic. 
One is that in the previous situations, it is true that the central government was at least vocally on the side of the people, right? M- maybe not specifically on the side of the protesters, but at least they issue kind of vague statements about serving the people, protecting the people, treating the people well. And now you are a local resident. You see the local officials, you know, brutalizing and taking away your land and locking you up. They see the difference between the rhetoric from the central government and the actions of the local governments. Even though I don't believe in that central rhetoric, I mean, it's really the central policy that are driving these local behavior. And after all, the local officials were appointed by the superior authorities. But you can, you know, you can argue that from their perspective, the local officials were doing things different from what the central government was saying. This time around, you cannot do that. (laughs) Xi Jinping has explicitly stated several times, this is his policy. He owns it. And he has said many, many times. And in fact, if you look at the implementation of the zero COVID, usually the local officials began with a softer version of the lockdown in Shanghai. That's what happened. They call it precision lockdown. Rather than locking down the whole city, they locked down one restaurant, one residential compound and things like that. And then central government sent a vice premier in charge of COVID, and she ordered the Shanghai government to implement citywide lockdown. So clearly, the local government was doing a bidding of the central government, this disconnect between the central rhetoric and the local actions. The other fundamental difference is that I think this is dealing with the caliber of the protesters this time around. Many of them are urbanites, more educated, right? College students, professional class, and middle class. They don't suffer from the cognitive dissonance as much as maybe other people do. They can see through the connections between the zero COVID and the autocracy under Xi Jinping. Right. And that's why they openly called for the author of Xi Jinping. You definitely didn't see that in the previous situations. And also, uh, you don't quite see that even this time around among rural people, and even though they suffer from and migrant labor workers, right? So there was a previous incident of migrant workers at the Foxong factory. These are kind of people at the lower educational and socioeconomic uh, level. All they asked was compensations and wages. They didn't escalate their grievances to a systemic level. But the college students don't think about issues that way. The middle class doesn't think about issues that way. The white collar professionals don't think about that way. So they tend to think about these things in systemic terms rather than in terms of just local officials. I think you and others have been making this point that what is different now is that the leadership seems to be more united in enforcing a certain policy in comparison to, say, 1989 and also before, where you had sections of the leadership that was more in favor of restraint or even giving the protesters a hearing. And again, to go back to the Wukan case, the PLA was outside the village, but it did not enter. There was a conscious attempt at de-escalating the conflict I want to move our conversation into a slightly different direction and going back to the Chinese state, Yasheng. How powerful is the Chinese state today, which is something that you are concerned about in this uh, forthcoming book, because we always think that the Chinese state is powerful. So if it is powerful, 
That is number one. And the second one is why is it then so powerful? First of all, I think it's extremely powerful. And there's now a emerging narrative that look at the protests. The Chinese state is not as effective and powerful as, as we feared. I'm not going to say this is a completely wrong perspective. It is partially correct. Let, let's put it in slightly different terms. Can you think of any other autocracy who could lock up as many as 400 million people in some sort of incarcerations, right? Either in their homes and or in few hospitals, nobody ever has attempted to do something on this scale. Perhaps only North Korea is capable of that. Probably North Korea, yeah. But that's a that's a telling comparison, right? Because the first country you think about is North Korea, and, and <laughs> so that's that's a pretty powerful demonstration of the power of the Chinese uh, state. And they have done it for three years, not three days, not three weeks, not three months, three years. Yes, there are protests breaking out now. This is after three years of sustained lockdowns that have brought about unbelievable level of misery, collateral damage, not to mention economic costs and psychological costs and, and all of that. And there's a lot of awareness that this is going on, right? The social media is censored, but isolated reportings uh, have happened. You cannot possibly say, just on the basis of protests during one weekend, that this is not a powerful state. This is extremely powerful state. My view is that even powerful state, as powerful as Chinese state, can overplay its hand, right? As we talked about, China was powerful before. The Chinese state was powerful before. But the Chinese state before was kind of clever about it. Let's not make sure people coordinate. Let's make sure to isolate the protests. Let's make sure to localize the issues. Let's make sure that we have adequate capacity to compensate for the grievances. And this is one big difference between Xi Jinping and the previous autocrats. He is carrying the autocratic hubris to a degree that we simply have not seen, right? He's overplaying his hand. He's providing a coordinating mechanism. He's damaging the economy. He's damaging the private sector. The private sector has created jobs. Uh, by the way, the health code that the government is relying on to control the population was developed by Alibaba, was developed by Tencent. What is the gratitude in return? He cracked down on them. So I think we are seeing something different this time around. We are seeing a autocrat overplaying his hand, acting in a way that is fundamentally detrimental to that system. So in my book, and this is actually before the protests uh, happened, because protests only happened uh, this weekend, and I submitted my book manuscript in, in June, I already said that the system now is probably at its most unstable moment. I couldn't foresee the specific scenarios, specific contingencies, but any system cannot be pushed to this kind of limit as we are seeing now. And the protests are a demonstration of that source of instability. I talk about other sources of instability, but I do talk about the overreach. I, I think my prediction is that even if the current wave of protests is fading out, the potentials are always there. The turbulence is always there, and the socioeconomic roots are deeper and more systemic as compared with the socioeconomic roots that motivated the previous protests. I have often used the um, example of a pressure cooker to explain how the Chinese state has resolved these crises in the past that once the protest gathers steam, the whistle blows. The function of the whistle in a pressure cooker is to let off steam. And the Chinese state has often been very successful precisely using some of the strategies you just mentioned to let off that steam, 
So it's this regular letting off steam that I think has explained how these protests have been handled over the years. And perhaps that is what yeah. is different now. But I have to ask you, Yasheng, one of the biggest defense or the arguments in defense of the current policy of the Chinese government in terms of lockdowns is one that I've heard from many Chinese officials, but also others, that because of the relative lack of protection in terms of vaccine coverage, not everybody is vaccinated, the Chinese vaccine has not been as effective, without this strict policy, this is the argument, without this strict policy, we're talking about hundreds of millions of people dying, elderly, etc. So had there not been this strict three-year policy, we'd see a huge increase in the number of deaths. Isn't that convincing for you, that argument? Uh, it's not. Uh, there are several several things wrong with that argument. First of all, I let me let me say that lockdown as an emergency measure is completely justified. Locking down Wuhan in the early months of the COVID, when you didn't understand the underlying dynamics of the virus, when you didn't have the effective vaccines, when you didn't have the data and all these things that are necessary for a rational science-based response, you go medieval. <laughs> China did that, uh, by the way, in the Qing Dynasty, and, and they, they stopped the virus. The problem is that you persisted in that approach when the signs clearly indicates that the Omicron virus is more infectious, but it has lower mortality rate as compared before. And so that's one big difference between the Omicron variants and the initial wave of viruses. The other is that we have effective vaccines now, but they refuse to import the effective vaccines by Pfizer, by Moderna, and they insisted on the Chinese own vaccine, whose efficacy is at least doubted by, by scientists. And, and I think it was also shown, although here I'm not a, I'm not a scientist, so I, I cannot say this with confidence, that, but I did hear that early clinical trials showed that the Chinese vaccine had a particularly bad adverse effects, side effects on the elderly population. So Pfizer and Moderna, they actually tested these things on the elderly population first, on the people with underlying conditions. If it is safe, it was recommended to them first, and then roll out to the young people. China did exactly the opposite. They rolled it out to the young people. They withheld the vaccine from the old people on probably legitimate medical grounds. But then the way to solve that problem is to import vaccines that are effective against the infections in the older population and they refuse. So is it a matter of national pride? I wouldn't. I So when you say national, if you say pride on the part of people, I, I don't agree. It's the pride of one person. I mean, that's it. It's, it's the pride of one person. Chinese love foreign products. Chinese <laughs> yeah. love uh, imports. You know, look at the beef from Australia. Look at the uh, uh, wine and also the fish. Absolutely, the fish, the wine, the the uh, sushi from Japan, and and um, medicine. Chinese would go for foreign medicine every single time if they are given a choice between a domestic medicine and foreign medicine. It's not the pride on the part of the people. It is this kind of very narrow nationalistic motivation to showcase the China model by one leader. Basically, that's it, by one leader. And the other thing I want to emphasize is it is hard for, for you to, to argue, or for these people to argue, that you can lock down 400 million people and you somehow don't have the capacity to vaccinate the elderly population. Or you forcibly remove people from their apartments to the few hospitals in buses using police force. Oh, but somehow you re really respect the individual rights of the elderly people not to be vaccinated, right? So th that argument somehow doesn't cohere. I, I, I don't give much credence to that argument. 
let's just face it. The virus is a virus. It is going to result in hospitalization and death, no matter how effective the vaccines are, no matter how effective the mitigation measures are. But I would argue that China actually has the best capacity in keeping the toll to a minimum as possible, as medically possible, and as administratively possible. In the US, I think in European countries, you don't have this capacity to compel people to use a health code, to isolate, to quarantine. You can only rely on science. I would argue that the Chinese government does have this strength in terms of the administrative tools, in terms of the health code that it has. So I can come up with an optimal combination between science, administrative control, and keep the death toll hospitalization rate to a lower level than you will otherwise have by relying either on science alone or on administrative control. China has, has, has that combination and they, they refuse to use it. I'm going to actually add another important dimension, particularly from a European perspective, not so much in the US, which is trust in government. So you can't compel yeah. people, but you can refer to the science. And in Scandinavia, for example, in Norway, people have a tendency to trust the government. So you you listen. But even here, after two years, and Omicron was the defining criteria uh, or the moment, because uh, after two years, even people here said, you know, we don't agree with, with harsh lockdowns. But there's something about trust. But you're saying what is particularly interesting is that in the beginning of the COVID crisis, I was marveling at the logistical capacity of the Chinese state. You were mentioning the, the lockdowns, but also the hospitals. I mean, everything, the logistical prowess of the Chinese state was on full display. And I was very impressed. And generally, everybody, including you, I think you wrote in the New York Times mm -hmm. saying, well, there's something about Chinese society that obeys or respects power, etc. Going back to what we just agreed, yes, the Chinese state is powerful. The question then is, why is it so powerful? Is it because, as you may argue, that society is weak, that the state is basically all over society? Is, is that the argument? Which yeah. is also a bit puzzling when you think about some of these videos that have emerged where citizens are actually quite critical of the police, you know, and they, they they criticize the police regularly and there's no fear of being locked up. And so I see Chinese society as being sometimes can be confrontational, you know, speak their mind. And yet perhaps your argument is that society has been kept under check. So maybe you can explain that argument better for my listeners. The way that you frame the issue is, is uh, super, super interesting. But let me say that the fact that you have individuals shouting at police is not a necessarily indication of, of a strong society. If you have an NGO that negotiates with police, if you have media exposing the misconduct of the police, then I will say you have evidence of a strong society. When we say society, I think there's a specific definition uh, of a society. It is an organized society. It is not just individuals who exist outside of the state, who can sort of have their own individual decision-making rights and taking the hands into their own hand. Vigilante is not a sign of society. Vigilante is a sign of utter individualism without the benefit of a society. The confrontations and, and that you have witnessed and, and others have witnessed at the individual level are really driven by the fact that you don't have other mechanisms to deal with this issue. That's the only thing that's left, which is shouting at the police. And also, we have to know that if the police are responsible for enforcing lockdowns of the whole apartment buildings, apartment compounds, the whole residential district, then you have a few individuals shouting at the police. 
these are not proportional. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, yeah, you're uh, right. Yeah, it's 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 really relative to the to the misery. Uh, shouting at the police is uh, I will put in a mild response. Um, so, and then in my book I discuss the roots of why the society failed to emerge in China, in contrast to India. In contrast to Europe, and you know, I proposed uh, a potentially controversial hypothesis proposition. It is the civil service examination system established in China in the sixth century. You know, you did work on India's、uh, civil service system, but I believe that was imported from England, and England learned from Prussia, U.S. learned from England. And Prussia learned from China. China was the original inventor of the civil service examination system. In my book, I detailed how systematic that system was, how pervasive that system was, and how long-lasting that system has been. And it's not just merely taking an exam; it is an incubation of authoritarian values. It is incubation of values that defer to the state. It is incubation of values that don't think that individuals matter. Right? All you do is to guess what the standard answers are. You memorize. Sheer memory. It's a sheer memorization, and it's guessing what the right answers are. What are the questions are going to appear on the exam? You essentially have no individual agency. Without individual agency, you don't have society. So in my book, I talk about this paradox that democratization is advocated often on individual values, but democratization happens and is activated on the basis of collective action. So what the civil service examination system did was essentially taking out collective action. Mindset from the Chinese population, and that's a system we have had since the sixth century. I see some of this also in educational systems in some parts of the world. You know where. It's all about getting a good grade, and a、yeah. good grade is just memorizing, mugging、mm. up things, and just vomiting it out, <laughs> and also just referring to that one textbook rather than consulting alternative sources of information. So even in India, you would have that. Yeah, yeah. It's that one history book. It could be discussions on the Holocaust, where you have this one narrow idea of the Holocaust, where Hitler sometimes can also be. Projected as being the savior rather、yeah. than a villain, but what is it about that exam, Yansheng? What is it that they did? Because I read in your book that, in a way, made Chinese human capital homogeneous. That on the one hand you had knowledge, memorization, cognitive inclination, frame of references of a narrow ideology of neo Confucianism. But it also reduced then the scope of action. It was the system where everybody wanted to be a part of the civil society, a civil、yeah. service, because it was it, it was considered to be prestigious. It guarantees you a job. It's good for marriages. You know, this was the case also in India. Yeah, thirty years ago, if you if you got into the Indian administrative service, it helped your case in the marriage market. Everybody、yeah. wanted to get their daughters and sons married to you. So you had that. That system of incentives that made it very difficult to think out of the box, right? Is that is that what you mean by the reduced scope of action? That you did not、yeah. think differently. You wanted to be part of this homogeneous system for fear of being left out and excluded. That's what I was writing about. Essentially, that mindset, the mindset was set by the new Confucianist curriculum of the civil service exam system. But there's more. So you talk about the Indian、uh, Administrative Service. I will bet that Indian Administrative Service today is a lot less popular as compared with 1960s and 1970s. That's correct. Nobody wants to join the IAS anymore Nobody, because 
they have competition. The private sector. They have competition from Infosys. They have competition from WIPO. They have competition from private sector. They may have competition from technology, NGOs, universities, and all of that. So one of the things that the Chinese civil service examination system did was it wiped out the competition. All the human capital flowed, quality human capital flowed to the imperial bureaucracy. By the way, this is different from college examination system in India, college examination system in China today and in the US. That's a one-shot deal. You take it, you know, you, you don't find many 55 years old in, in colleges in India or in China. Or in That's America. correct. In the Chinese civil service examination system, sometimes you made it at the age of 67. I documented several cases in my book. Really? Absolutely. And you started preparing as young as three years old, four years old, five years old. So it is also monopoly of your time. There's so much to memorize. So you want to start early because young people have better memories. And you can take it repeatedly throughout your life. So you want to do it again and again and again and again. Many people who made it, made it only after number of times that they took it. So it's monopolizing your time. And during this whole time, you're not thinking about starting a business. You're not thinking about starting a religion. You're not thinking about starting a university. So, so when you have this system for almost 1,500 years, essentially the society, in a way I define it, is drained of human capital, is drained of talents, right? Remember in the old times, in the ancient times, you didn't really have technology. You didn't have you know, gadgets and things like that. Human capital is all you have. So essentially, this, the civil service, is, I mean, there is some, you know, using academic language, there is some indigeneity here, right? So whether or not civil service stifled the commerce or the lack of commerce strengthened the civil service. So we can go into that. Probably they go in both directions. The simple thing is that the, the, the phenomenon that we observe is that you have one powerful state left that sucks every oxygen from the air, that you have nothing left for anything else. I, I documented in my book the high level of literacy achieved because of the civil service exam system, the high level of numeracy. But remarkably, China never had autonomous university, never had autonomous learned societies because there's no competition with the, with the imperial state. So because of that mechanism, the society failed to emerge, society failed to develop. And until recently, that was all you had. And, and that explains the weaknesses of these other actors. Even today, that tradition has continued. It's not that today every single Chinese wants to go into service. It is that, and there's very, very sort of something clever about it. Essentially, Chinese society now has powerful corporations, private sector corporations, but they make sure that these powerful corporations are just powerful corporations in narrow business sense. You don't have business associations. You don't have chamber of commerce. You don't have at least autonomous chambers of commerce, right? So look at what happened to Jack Ma. Yeah, I was thinking of that. Yeah, so he was wiped out just like that, right? So a very powerful businessman, you know, luminary and role model for millions of the young Chinese. If the government wants to lift a finger on him, he's gone, just like that. So you can have these powerful individuals as individuals, but no matter how powerful you are, no matter how rich you are, as long as you are just an individual, you are always powerless vis-a-vis -vis the state. I was thinking, well, what has changed in the last three decades with economic growth, etc. It is precisely the the rise of entrepreneurs who have had the freedom to gain wealth, 
and thereby inequality has increased in within China. But that comes at a price that if you get too big for your boots, the state will bring you down, which is what I suppose was the case with Jack Ma. Well, so but but the state didn't bring him down before Xi Jinping, and he was already getting big before. I think a lot of this there there's kind of Xi Jinping specific factors. He values control more than previous autocrats, right? So the issue we discussed earlier about zero COVID, corruption, anti-corruption campaign. Previous leaders carried out anti-corruption campaigns, but they kind of knew that you. Couldn't really scale these campaigns too much, because once you do that, you really create such a level of insecurity that would require additional controls, and those additional controls are not very good for economic development. So, so they would just leave, you know, leave the situation there and move on. And the result of that, predictably, is rising corruption and rising. Crony capitalism and, and, and things like that. I view the Jack Ma case as really the aftermath of the anti-corruption campaign. The first wave, you go after the corrupt officials and intellectuals and, and media, and then in the second wave, you go after those business people who you suspect were behind. Some of these powerful politicians, former leaders and former Politburo members, right? So, so essentially, there's a kind of a logical sequence. Once you have decided to go down this path, you cannot really stop. I, I, the way I describe Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign is that it is a little bit like riding a bicycle. The way that he did it, you stop, you fall, you continue, then you have to accelerate. That is not a very good. Situation to be in, because it creates its own dysfunctional dynamics. It raises the level of a, a political temperature. It raises the stakes in political power struggles. The the things that the previous leaders were very careful to manage, and, and that's actually another reason why I predict, quite apart from the protests on the street, that there's going to be more turbulence. Coming down online. One issue that I've been wondering about is this association of merit with the Chinese civil service. So this merit-based bureaucracy, the growth of that, and we think about the Chinese Mandarin. You think about mm -hmm. it's all very difficult. The exams you get in, your top-notch elite, just like the IAS. To what extent would you subscribe to the view that historically the Chinese bureaucracy was based on merit? How real was that meritocracy? Yeah. Okay. This is a very good question. A very complicated one. I think if we define meritocracy narrowly, which is that it is based on your performance on the exam, I would argue that the imperial bureaucracy was meritocratic. The issue is sometimes when we talk about meritocracy, we automatically think about good things, maybe science, maybe good policy, maybe good public health measures. That's not what was going on. So the content was this very rigid ideology, memorization of、uh, Confucianist texts that are basically worthless、uh, in terms of day-to-day -day operations of the government. And actually, in my in one chapter that I that I have, I show that Chinese technological leadership collapsed soon after they instituted the meritocracy, right? Because the meritocracy pivoted people away from kind of idiosyncratic pursuits. Science could be in the ancient times a one idiosyncratic pursuit. Poetry could be another. Religion could be another. You pivoted all these things away from that and focus on something that was totally useless in terms of、uh, running the country, developing the economy, developing the society. In the current times, you can and and I praise the infrastructure. I don't praise the content. The government can repurpose this infrastructure and inject useful metrics. At one point, it was the GDP and, and all of that. That was also disrupted by Xi Jinping. 
in my telling of Xi Jinping, he was actually pivoting China to China before sixth century, when it was more personalistic, when it was much less meritocratic. He's not talking about loyalty to him. He's talking about loyalty, allegiance to the party. All these are pretty subjective, right? So by my definition of meritocracy, that's not meritocracy because it's not as objective as it was before. And the problem with that is China could run the government on that basis when it was very small, when it was a boutique operation. Now China is massive. The government is massive. The country is massive. The economy is massive. The technology is complex. The global environment is massive and, and, and complex. When you go back to that personalistic subjective system, that's not going to be a good prescription for, for right policies. Our friend at MIT, Darun Asimoglu, and I, we've been chatting on one of his latest books, The Narrow Corridor, and Darun and Jim Robinson talk about this narrow space that allows societies to develop and thrive. And for that to happen, the state and society have to be running together. Yeah at the same time, as fast as possible. And if one outruns the other, then you would have weak states or two strong states. How would you, if you were to use that analogy, how do you see the future of the Chinese state? A lot of people would say these protests will fizzle out. Maybe there'll be new ones. But how do you see these recent protests having maybe changed that dynamic between state and society relations in China? Yeah, so that's a very complicated question because it requires us to say something about how the protests are going to unfold, what are the specific situations under which they unfold. Yeah, that's a new podcast altogether. <laughs> yeah, that's a new podcast altogether. But what I'm willing to say is that China before 6th century was primed for that kind of narrow, uh, narrow corridor scenario to emerge. The civil service examination system stopped that. And in the recent times, the 1980s, a much less known decade, misunderstood decade, was primed for that to happen. But then it was stopped by Tiananmen. And since then, I would argue between 1989 and 2018. So I, I used 2018. That was the year Xi Jinping got rid of the, the, the term limit you had a different kind of scope, right? So private sector, entrepreneurship, and technology. And, and arguably, you had some narrow scope scenario, although controlled by the state carefully, but you still had some of that. Now, it is completely just the state. The state is incredibly strong, incredibly uh, powerful. But the problem that we have is that we know from history that state can be very powerful on Sunday. It can collapse on Monday. Soviet Union was very powerful uh, sometime in 1989. But when the economy was in a bad shape, when the society was completely stagnant, that was actually not a very good thing for that state. Right? So I would argue that Xi Jinping probably accelerated this scenario more than he helped because look at what he has done. He's, he's undercutting private sector, which has been supplying jobs, supplying tax revenues, supplying technology to the state. He's undercutting them. How can that possibly be good for the Chinese Communist Party, right? So to conclude, essentially you need some, you, you need to give society and the economy some leeway you want to put control on them. Now I'm, I'm wearing the hat of Xi Jinping, not, not as a scholar. That's actually the clever way to keep it going. But that's not what is happening now. Yasheng, congratulations on your book. I'm looking forward to it coming out soon in the next few months. It was such a pleasure to have you on the program today. Thank you. This is an incredibly enjoyable experience. Thank you very much, Dan. 
If you enjoyed this conversation, please spread the news among friends and colleagues and share the link to the podcast on social media. You can tag us on Twitter at Global Dev Pod and Dan Bannock. Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo Center for Development and the Environment. Please email your questions, comments, and suggestions to inpursuitofdevelopment at gmail.com.